Hi, my precious friends, my beloved sisters and brothers. Um, let's continue in this process. It's so interesting for me too to be part of this amazing spiritual process in the body of Christ where we are led by the Holy Spirit day by day now. And when you are tuned in to the Holy Spirit and live your life in prayer, you will hear what God says to the church. You will hear what the Spirit is saying, what is right to think and to do and how to act in these crucial times but very very interesting times i can feel there is a lot of battle going on in the spirit different kinds of spiritual battles all over this world it's 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 crazy actually it's like a, a spiritual world war and i believe that's exactly what it is but we are fighting for our future. We are fighting for the revival. We are fighting for the prophetic word to come alive, to come true, to be manifested. And we need to stand together. I was reminded, I will tell you this before I start my subject today. You know, I spoke about uh, the unity last time. And uh, God showed me from this movie, The Gladiator. You remember that movie? With Russell Crowe. In the beginning of the movie, it's, it's a war uh, scene, you know. Uh, and he is the, the captain or the officer of his uh, army. Mighty army. And they're fighting out there in the battlefield and they have these weapons and this uh, armor, just like the armor God is talking about in the Bible. With the shield and the sword and the helmet and the belt, everything. And the, the shield is so big in the natural, it almost cover a whole person. And then he's shouting to his army, in the middle of the war, everybody come together and they line up together, shoulder to shoulder with their, with their uh, um, shields like that, bam, bam, bam. And some have shields over their heads. And what it turned out to be is like a iron wall. They building a wall for the enemy with their shields because they are united. It would not have any effect if one or two soldiers did that. But when all the army are standing lined up like that with their, with their shields over their heads and over the front, they are creating this mighty wall that is impossible for the enemy to shoot through with the arrows. And that is exactly why we need in the spirit to be united. Like I said, divided we fall, united we stand. So united is a big powerful word. I can see how the enemy tried to steal because he does counterfeits on everything that God has the original plan to. It's like he's stealing God's blueprint in heaven and try to copy it and perverse it. Everything from, um, yeah, he's, he's like copy everything, you know. I, I can tell you one example. God speaks a lot about jewels and gemstones in, in his word to express value. And the enemy has taken that and used it in a new age term where people are actually believing that something is happening when you have that stone in your house and it's, it's, uh, it's something witchy with it. So the enemy, when he does something to copy God because he doesn't have a fantasy, 
So he just tried to copy what God has created and try to do it in an ugly way, a perverted way, a dark way, uh, using witchcraft to deceive people. That's why new age is a, such a deception. Uh, so that's why also the enemy wants to kill all these babies in abortion because it's against God, it's against God. And the new world order, they have some kind of philosophy that they will, will be one. Is this oneness, but it's not that unity that God is speaking about people. It's, it's a totally different oneness. So don't be confused now. When the world order speaks about one government, one church, one money system on this planet, and, and all the, 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 the borders to the, the, the nations are going to be erased. And it's going to just be one, one big nation. Everything is going to be one and one ruler. And it's building up to the Antichrist kingdom. For him to come and sit on his little throne here. To rule over this earth. It's in the Bible. The Revelation. But this is not the oneness that God is speaking about. The unity of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ and we don't function by ourselves. It's very important that we are united in the spirit now. That we stop doing these childish behaviors with uh, being jealous, uh, you know, having the divisions among each other and critical and you know all this gossip and all this childish behavior in the body of Christ we need to come to maturity now and lay aside all this childish thinking and acts because we will never get into that part it, it is going to take so many years before God can raise up his body if we are not doing our our part such as starting to love one another that's what jesus was praying in john 17 that we would love one another that we will be one just as he and the father and the holy spirit were one that was his earnest prayer people that we will be one and we need to to work on that now, because together we are strong, together we are unconquerable, to, together we are going to conquer this world's um, system and the darkness trying to defeat us here and defeat the church. We need to stand up together. We need to be one in the spirit. That's the key. And, and we also need to be unified in love. One day they will say, I hope that they will come pretty soon. Look how much they love one another. The, the Christians, they, they really love one another. Even if we are different and we may have different opinions about stuff, that should not separate us from being one body. Remember that we are the body. We're called to be the body of Christ. And, and, and God wants that from the deepest of his heart. He wants his children to be one everywhere. So I'm going to read us something powerful. Everything in the Bible is powerful to me. I love the word of God. It's from, um, let's see, 1 John chapter 4. Glasses on, ready to go. God is love. God is love. Don't forget about love, people. Everything we are doing here has to be rooted and grounded in love. Unless it's worth nothing, 1 Corinthians 13 says. Maybe I'll read it after. First, I will read this. 1 John 4 from the seven words and I read it in the passion translation 
Those who are loved by God, let his love continually pour from you to one another. Pour the love that is in your heart from one another. Because God is love. That's what he is. His name is love. Everyone who loves is fathered by God and experiences an intimate knowledge of him. The one who doesn't love has yet to know God, for God is love. The light of God's love shined within us when he sent his matchless Son into the world, so that we might live through him. This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. Long before we loved him, he loved us. It was his love, not ours. He proved it. He proved his love by sending his son to be the pleasing sacrifice, sacrificial offering to take away our sins. I need to take them off and just do like this. Sometimes it's easier to read without glasses. Think about this scripture now. Meditate on these words, people. This is wisdom. This is God's word. This is how we should live. Let us tune in today and correct ourselves today. And check ourselves if we are in this love. Delightfully loved ones. If he loved us with such a tremendous love. Then loving one another should be our way of life. It should be natural. No one has ever gazed upon the fullness of God's splendor. But if we love one another. God makes his permanent home in us wow did you hear what i just said when we love one another god makes his permanent home in us people he will dwell in us he wants to live with us he wants our lives to be his home when we are loving one another where we are loving there is god God is love. So when we are loving one another, showing love like God showed through Jesus Christ, how much he loved us. He proved it. it. It was not just words from heaven. He proved it by sending his son that was crucified for us. And Jesus was God in heaven. Yet he gave away his godliness and came down to this earth like a human being, suffered like a human being, went through all this unrighteousness, injustice, pain, rejection, all that stuff, that hurtful stuff for you and me. And his father was looking into from heaven down, looking how his son was suffering for you and me. That is love. The Bible says no one has greater love than the one that gives his life for his brothers and sisters. Jesus showed us he had the greatest love. He gave his life for you and for me. No one has greater lo love than that. So if we love one another, because it's natural when you are connected to God, when you love Jesus, you will be driven by love. You will carry great love to your sisters and your brothers. You will not try to push your brother or your sister down. You will not speak bad about them. You will not be jealous. You will not have division because you love them. Listen. And we make our permanent home in him. And his love is brought to its full expression in us. And he has given us his spirit within us so that we can have 
the assurance that he lives in us and that we live in him. So that is the guarantee that Jesus is living in us, that we have the Holy Spirit. That's the assurance that he lives in us. Moreover, we have seen with our own eyes and can testify to the truth that Father God has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Those who give thanks that Jesus is the Son of God, living God. And God lives in them. We have come into an intimate experience with God's love and we trust in the love he has for us. Do you trust in his love for you? Do you really believe that he loves you? Do you live after that belief system that you are so loved? Regardless if you are sinning, if you have flaws, if you have weaknesses, you are loved 100% all the time. Because he loved you before you loved him. He loved you before when we were sinners. He loved you. He loved you and me. He was on the cross when we were out there doing sin. That's how much he loves us. So he can't love us more. If you try to earn love from God, you can't do it. You have to receive it. It's given freely and he wants you to take it for free. It's nothing you can do to earn it. Just receive his love. Believe that he loves you. And pour that love out of you into your brothers and sisters. God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God. You are living in God when you love my precious friend. And God lives through them. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us. So that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment. When you are here in him, when you're abiding in him and he abides in you, you have no fear. You're fearless because you're safe. Because you're living in that source here where you know you loved and you love him. Your safe place is here. It's love. God has made his home inside your heart, my friend. And then you fear, you fear nothing, not even the judgment that it, that is ahead. You know, you don't gonna fear it because you're in His love. Uh, where was I? Fearless face the day of judgment because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. Love never brings fear never brings fear for fear is always related to punishment but love's perfection drives out fear of punishment far from our hearts whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment or any other type of fear i would say has not reached love's perfection so if you are driven by fear today and you are a Christian, you haven't received the love that God actually has for you and start living in it. You haven't lived and grasped the love that Christ has for you because when you truly abide in him and live in his love for you, you will have no fear. That's true. Whoever walks constantly, yes, I read that. Our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. Anyone can say, I love God. Many people say, I love God, I love God. They even worship God, a God they don't know. Many people does that. I'm sorry to tell you. 
They're coming every Sunday to the church. They say, Amen, Hallelujah, or I love you, Jesus. And they don't even know him because they're full of fear and other fleshly behavior. And, and, and wouldn't you like to know the one that you say that you love? Wouldn't you like to know the one that you have given your life to? Would, wouldn't you like to know how, how he is personally? Because God is eager to show you how much he loves you and who he truly is through a personal relationship with you. It's not enough for God that you go every Sunday to church. It can end up in a religious tradition. It doesn't mean anything to God unless your heart is not connected to him, to the source. It's true. It's a, it's a scripture in the Bible that says, You honor me with your lips, but your heart are far away from me. And I've been to churches like that. It's scary. It's so beautiful. Everything is lined up. It's like a beautiful concert. A godly concert. Everything is like perfect. The program. People, they behave nice. They lift their hands. But there is no spirit there. There is no anointing there. There's no power there. It's powerless because... They're doing it out of tradition. And then it's not worth anything. I was standing in, in a church and I heard God said that word to me one day. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Do you, do you realize how much that hurt God's heart? That we don't take what he has given us seriously? That we are actually ungrateful. We haven't grasped what he truly has done for us through Jesus Christ. By allowing his only, his only, only begotten son to come down to this earth to rescue us. To give his life, to suffer for you and me. That's the greatest love no one can give. And through that crucifixion and death and resurrection... He gave humankind grace to live an eternal life in heaven with him. That we can come boldly before the throne. Whenever we have done something wrong, we can come and say, God, I'm sorry. I repent. Can you forgive me? And instantly you made, you made pure. He cleansed you instantly. Instantly he forgive you when you repent. In the Old Testament it was different. It was laws. Probably all of us would be stoned to death. If we still would be living under the law. But we are living under grace. And don't let that grace be in vain. Don't let what Jesus did on the cross be in vain people. Take it in. Let the Holy Spirit paint for you today what Jesus truly did for you and for me. And open up your heart for his love. Today is a day of salvation. Anyone can say I love God. Yet have hatred toward another believer. Hmm. You don't love God when you hate somebody, you know. Because God don't hate anybody. This makes him a phony. Because if you don't love a brother or a sister whom you can see. How can you truly love God who you cannot see? Hmm? When you, go, you say, yeah, I love her. I love him. And, and then... You say you love God, but, but you, 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 you can't see him. So if you don't love your brother and sister, how is that possible when you say you love God, who you can't see? That love 
needs to come through us people. It needs to come through us now. We need to start loving one another as he loved us. For he has given us this command. Is a command. Is an order. He ordered us to one thing. And that is whoever loves God must also demonstrate love to others. You cannot sit by yourself and say i love god i love god i worship god i love him so much and then you hate your brother and then you're not nice to people you treat people bad you're ignoring people's problems you have no empathy you don't care about people but you love god no you don't love god you don't know god you don't know his love it's just words coming out of your mouth like poem you know doesn't mean anything. God wants to see proof of those words that you are saying with your mouth. He wants to see it in action in your life. I'm going to read. Do you have more time? Yeah, I'm going to take time to read also. First Corinthians chapter 13 some of it from the verse four what is love love is large and incredible patient love is gentle and um what does it say constantly kind to all constantly kind to all it refuses to be jealous when you love you refuse to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Yeah. It's so easy in our flesh to be a little jealous and envy people when they are blessed. But when you are in, in him, you just are happy for other people's blessings and success. You want them su to succeed, right? It's your joy to see that it goes well with their lives. That is love. Love does not brag about one's achievements, nor inflate its own importance. You're not lifting yourself up. You're not self-promoting. You're humble. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrate honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stop, stops believing the best for others. Not the best for you, but for other people around you. That should be your joy, to see others succeed in this life. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Love, love never stops loving. Love never stops loving. You know, the more you love, the more love you will get. It pours out of you. The more you show love, the more love will come out of you, so to speak. It extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which eventually fades away. It is more enduring than tongues, which will one day fall silent. So you can't rely on that, your gifts. Love remains long after words of knowledge are forgotten. Our present knowledge and our prophecies are but partial. But when love's perfection arrives, the partial will fade away. When I was a child, I spoke about childish matters. That's what childish people do. They spoke, speak in a childish way. They are easily offended. They are jealous. They are easy to hurt. And you know, they're stubborn, they're rebellious because they are kids. They're acting like a child. 
For I saw things like a child, and I reasoned like a child, but the day came when I matured, and I set aside my childish ways. So that's the decision. Now I'm not going to be childish anymore. I'm going to be mature. I'm going to stop being this childish kid in the, in the body of Christ. Who are stubborn and don't want to cooperate with other people, want to be my myself, my opinions, it's what counts. Easily irritated, I don't want to apologize, I don't want to forgive. You stop doing that at some point because you come to your senses, like the the prodigal son that he came to himself, and then you realize. I'm a child. I need to 